My boss is a tuck your shirt in, no, among other things. So I found a loophole in the dress code where I don't have to tuck in my shirt. What things have you done by the book just to piss off your boss? Story one. Used to work at a TV station. Absolutely awful management and horrible bosses. Complained about it to friends all the time. Some would even ask me on Facebook about my job and I would reply, but I knew I could get fired for speaking ill of the company. So I read the HR handbook and found out that as long as I don't specifically name the company, I can't be fired for it. So about a month later, I realize I can't take this crap anymore and post on Facebook how terrible my job is, never mentioning the company by name. They fired me a day later. I gladly walked out of that building and into a lawyer's office, got $17,800 my yearly salary. Seriously. Feels good, man. Story two. I used to work at the Jaws ride at Universal Studios Florida. Our uniform consisted of a blue t-shirt, jeans or jean shorts, white socks and white shoes. The unofficial dress code had all of us girls wearing jean shorts and white knee socks. One summer, I ended up working the Jaws ride and the Jungle Cruise at Walt Disney World simultaneously. I loved Disney and had always wanted to work there, but I ended up finding it stifling with all sorts of silly and over-the-top rules. At the Jungle Cruise, you wear a khaki shirt, khaki shorts or pants, white socks and brown shoes. One day, I didn't have any normal-sized socks to wear to the Jungle Cruise, so I ended up wearing my white knee-highs, which looked ridiculous with the Jungle costume. When I got to work, one of my managers flipped his crap, told me my socks weren't in compliance with the Disney look, the official policies on how to dress at Disney, and made me roll my socks down. It looked like I was wearing little white life preservers around my ankles, and looked more out of place than they looked originally. I was annoyed. So when I went home, I scoured my Disney look booklet for the policies pertaining to socks. All I could find was that socks had to be long enough to cover the ankle bone. There was no maximum height. Hell, I could have worn white tights under my khaki shorts if I really wanted to. The next day, I wore my knee highs again as a small act of rebellion. The same manager was there and he flipped out. He actually pulled me into the office to write me up. But before he could get me to sign the paperwork, I pulled out my copy of the Disney look and showed him that, while incredibly silly looking, my socks were perfectly acceptable and that I would continue wearing them like that. And so I did. I looked stupid, but I didn't care. Working for Disney wasn't a pleasant experience in my opinion, and it was very liberating to know that I could at least wear my socks however the hell I wanted to. Story 3. I used to work for this small town, twice-weekly newspaper. The editor, publisher, mayor, county commissioner, and a few other people were skimming tax dollars. When I confronted my boss about it, he told me he'd blackball me if I said anything. So I went to the local television station, tipped them off, and they uncovered the story. When they won their awards, my name was added to the list of reporters. I still can't get a job as a journalist, but damn if it didn't feel good. Story 4. My brother-in-law worked for UPS for 17 years. He was a bit of a joker and was constantly getting in trouble for coming to work with crazy hair colours or cornrows. He was a big Italian guy and was told it wasn't appropriate. It was always something, but they couldn't say anything about him wearing sunglasses. So his little rebellion was... He would wear the most outrageous sunglasses he could think of, ones shaped like giant red lips, guitars with stems sticking up, and purple ones with rhinestone hearts on them. Anything for a laugh. After a while, people knew him by his glasses. If someone said they lived in a certain area, I would say, Oh, my brother-in-law is your UPS man, the guy with the crazy glasses. And their reply would almost always be something like, Ah, John. Yeah, I love that guy. He's hilarious. He passed away four years ago. He was hit by a drunk driver while he was out walking one night. When we attended his funeral, all of the guys from work came dressed in their browns with crazy sunglasses on. His best friend gave his eulogy wearing a pair of neon green glasses three times the size of his face. And the pastor even borrowed John's guitar glasses when he went up to speak. After his funeral, we counted. He had over 200 different pairs. What started as him being a pain in the ass to his boss ended as a tribute to his character in the life of always wanting to make someone else smile. Story 5. While I was in the Navy, it was recommended that I get extensive surgery on my ankle. My command felt that I didn't deserve a bunch of time off for a surgery, so they said they would approve it, but none of the convalescent leave. They refused to sign any paperwork. The first thing I did was hit them with the regulation stating that they were required to respond to all requests within a certain amount of time, three days I think. They responded with a no. 
So then I had the Navy legal draw up the paperwork, in accordance with regulations, that my command would be responsible for 100% of my medical care if they did not abide by doctor's orders. I then let them know that would mean that all of my medical care would then be handled by civilians and the command would be responsible for paying the bill out of their budget. They approved my surgery, convalescent leave, and convalescent leave extension. Story 6. Not so much a tuck-in-shirt nasty situation, but here goes. My boss went away for about three to four weeks for a conference, and while he was away, a workmate and I had an idea. A George Foreman grill. And then we'd go to the deli and grab stuff for lunch. Hamburgers, lamb chops, pork, steaks, etc. We did this every day for over a month. And when the boss got back, he put a stop to it, with the exact words, I don't want that thing inside the office. So we took it to the shared kitchen area on our floor. We rented a suite. When he got angry at that and said, I don't want it on this floor, we took it down to the underground parking area and used the power outlet at his parking space while he was out at lunch. He caught us because he was coming back from lunch with a business partner in the car with him, and we were hunched over a tiny George Foreman grill making hamburger patties. Imagine three IT guys crouching on the ground like cavemen in a poorly lit underground parking lot, cooking hamburgers on the concrete floor. Yeah, it went over about as well as you would think. If he didn't specifically use the words, take that home, or I will break it and throw it in the trash, our next step was to use the power point in the parking lot of the church directly opposite the building and facing his office. Story 7. Not my story, but a co-worker. Worked at a water park. The supervisor was a witch who wouldn't let the lead guards at the top of the tallest slide in the park go to the bathroom. The guard at the top is radioing that he needs to take a sh**, but she won't let him. Mind you, the lead guards are allowed to ride down every once in a while to make sure no tubes are stuck. The lead guard is about to sh**t his pants in front of a ton of guests, so he goes into the utility closet and craps in a bucket of cat litter we kept to clean up vomit. He then proceeds to ride the slide down to clean himself off and leaves the supervisor to clean up his bucket of crap. Story 8. Back when I was working and attending classes, I would go straight from campus to work, getting me there anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes early before my shift. On occasion, my boss would ask me to help him out with something before I clock on, put something away or answer the phone. Over the span of a couple of months, this evolved from occasionally to every day your shift starts when you get here. After doing this for a couple of weeks, still clocking in at my usual 3pm, I decided that if I'm working for a few extra minutes each day, I'm going to get paid for it. I did this once, and I didn't make it an hour into my shift before my boss is screaming at me and throwing down the employee handbook, saying that I'm only allowed to clock in five minutes before and after my scheduled shift. Needless to say, I made it a point to not check in until five minutes after my scheduled shift every day, no matter how early I was. Fast forward three months and my boss gets fired. He got what was coming to him. Story 9. When I was in the army, I pulled my car up to an ATM machine on base to get cash. Four guys piled out leaving all doors open. While getting my cash, from somewhere behind me someone says, You actually drive that piece of crap? I should call in for a tow truck. Without bothering to turn around, I yelled back, Screw you and your tow truck! I never did see who it was as he was gone by the time I had my money. The next day, my squad leader calls me aside and asks me if I told the sergeant to go screw himself yesterday, and I had to admit that yes, I probably had. So I was in trouble. I had three other witnesses who were interviewed and signed sworn statements about the fact that I had told a staff sergeant to go screw himself and a tow truck. I was given the opportunity to read the incriminating statements before I made my own, just to point out that there was no point in lying. That was when I found out that only one guy had even known who it was because he was in civilian clothes, not on duty. So my statement detailed an aggressively profane and hostile person in civilian attire, identity unknown to me, whom I found to be acting irrationally and attempted to defuse further confrontation by responding jovially in kind fashion. The beauty was, without reading the other statements, I'd have been unable to mesh my version of events so perfectly with the bland facts the others reported. The key point is under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. There is no such thing as disrespecting a non-commissioned officer, only insubordination, which is very clear about being in uniform. At this point, everyone decided the best thing to do was to sweep it under the rug as the sergeant had far more to lose than I did, and magically everything went away. The sergeant continued to be a dick to me at every opportunity, so I made it a point of yelling, Hey P, screw you! whenever I saw him out of uniform.
Eventually, my squad leader asked me to stop as a personal favour to him, so I did. But it was fun for a while. Story 10. On the flip side, I'm the boss enforcing policy. When I took over the department, the old boss told me that the reason the place looked like crap was that when he asked a sales associate, base pay plus commission, to clean or put up stock, they claimed it wasn't in their job description. The main boss backed them up, calling it a technicality. I pulled out the description and read out other duties as assigned by the manager on the last line. Two out of nine quit. My department is now clean and stock is always up. Sales are consistently up. I'm cool with that. Story 11. When I was working at Office Max about 10 years ago, I was the only employee who didn't smoke. Needless to say, everyone in the building took a 15-minute smoke break two to three times a shift, and I got squat. One day, I asked the manager if I could have a clean air break, and he was confused. I explained that since smokers can have their 15 minutes breaks two to three times a shift, I should be able to step outside and do the same without having to smoke. Irked my manager, but he knew he had to let me to avoid any discrimination. Story 12. Not really my boss, but my school principal, which was really like a boss to me as a kid. I was at an Opus DEI school, so the nuns were pretty strict, and I hated the salads they gave us. I found multiple ways to hide the food, because... You can't throw food when there are millions of people starving. Until one day, I just went with a tray half full to dump it all. The nun went ballistic and I just said, I'm full, gluttony is a sin, and threw it all. That got me in trouble. I was nine. Story 13. I did a lot of things at my last job just to piss off management. One thing that they really hated was this. At our store, they wanted a minimum of 70% of our transactions to be membership transactions. So either someone with a membership or we signed someone up for a membership. I would, for a few days in a row, get 100% by only ringing one person through on my whole shift and making them use or sign up for a membership. And then, randomly, I'd ring someone through and make sure I don't use their membership card, so that day I would be at 0%. When they'd come to me and rant that my percentage was zero, I'd tell them that I'd been 100% all week and that it was only one transaction that I did that day and the person didn't want to sign up. They couldn't get mad at me for 0% on one person, you can't win them all. And they couldn't get mad at me for only ringing in one person every other day because my numbers were 100%. It annoyed the hell out of them, but on paper, it looked great. Bonus story. When I quit, I hid 105 pictures of myself all over the store. They still haven't found them all. Story 14. Back in high school, which was a public school, a small group of students, including myself, and a few teachers were going on a rare trip out of state. I was one of those punk kids' ruffians hoodlums, big pants, dark blue hair and white-out contacts. But I was also at to near the top of the class. We arrived at the airport shortly before the flight. This was a few years before 9-11. Pretty much dressed like a Mormon with clear contacts and my dark blue hair. We were going someplace directly after our short flight, so we were supposed to be presentable. One of the chaperones, a school counsellor who was quite familiar with me, it was a small school so everyone knew me, asked me, are you serious? Not usually, but what are you talking about? I asked. She goes on about how my unnatural hair colour is a distraction and that it reflects poorly on the school and our presence at this conference. As a side note, for several months leading up to this point, my hair had been a variety of colours, including some bright, annoying concoctions like magenta and turquoise. She then calls the principal over and asks her to send me home to make my hair look natural. I used the good stuff, semi-permanent hair dye, professionally done by a friend who was a hairdresser, so it wasn't changing anytime soon. The principal, who I considered a friend, looks at me and asks me what I thought. I respond that the counsellor's choice of hair colour, orange blonde, was not natural either. I went on that trip, and the country folk loved this city boy's funny hair. Story 15. When I was in grade 4, pizza was sold at lunch for $1.50 a slice. I saw a business opportunity and went to the Little Caesars a stone's throw away from the school and bought 10 hot and ready $5 pizzas and sold the slices for $1, 1.25 on Friday. When the school told me I couldn't sell pizza on school property, I moved my office to my aunt's house, which was next door. So every day at lunch, the kids would walk to the neighbor's front yard, buy pizza and come back to school. I was making a tidy sum every day. Story 16 when I worked at Best Buy, the dress code was black shoes, pants, a belt and tucked blue shirt. Never wore a belt nor tucked my shirt in because as a chubster, when kneeling and organising DVDs on the bottom shelf, my shirt comes untucked and the belt cuts into my belly. First world problems, huh? Anyways, 
My boss would constantly freak on me for not having my shirt tucked in and finally got on my case for not wearing a belt either. So I checked the dress code and found it said belt if there are belt loops on the pants or something. So I found an exacto knife and cut off my belt loops. The next morning I come in and she says, where's your belt? I grinned at her and said, where's my belt loops? And gave her the biggest grin I could muster. One of my finest moments. Story 17. Yet another high school story. So six or seven years ago, when the torn up jeans look was in my school, passed a rule prohibiting jeans with large holes in them. Most teachers only really cared about the rule if the hole was showing inappropriate amounts of skin, like near the ass or crotch. But there was one teacher that took it to mean any hole was forbidden. She was a PE teacher, and if she saw you with a hole in your jeans, she would make you either change or send you to the vice principal's office to get it sorted out. I had her in my two end period class, and one day I wore an old pair of ridiculously comfortable jeans that over time had worn a relatively small hole just under one of the knees. She flipped out and made me change into my smelly gym shorts, and I had to spend the rest of the day smelling like ball sweat. I tried to tell her how absurd it was that the amount of skin now showing after I changed to shorts was way more than before in my worn jeans, but she just ignored it and continued to cite the no-holes rule back at me. That night I took an old, ratty pair of jeans that barely fit anymore and took sandpaper to the knees so that each side had a decent-sized hole in it. The next day I made a point to sit in the front of her class wearing my fresh, holy jeans so she would call me out on them. When she called me out, I calmly stood up and walked to my backpack and pulled out a pair of scissors. In front of her and the entire class, I proceeded to cut the jeans where the holes were and turned them into jean shorts, f**k yeah, jorts, and sat back down silently. She was incredibly pissed off but knew she couldn't do anything about my no-holes jorts. Story 18 When Circuit City was still in business, I worked in the warehouse. For whatever reason, they had a strict dress policy of khaki pants and this awful collar shirt that also had to be tucked in. This went for everyone, even the warehouse. I discovered through an old warehouse employee guide, shoved in a drawer years ago and forgotten about, that as long as warehouse employees had khaki-coloured shorts with no cargo pockets and a t-shirt with a Circuit City logo, there would be no problem. Circuit City stopped making Circuit City t-shirts long before I started, but thanks to a local Salvation Army, I was able to pick up two Circuit City t-shirts and a quick trip to Target for some shorts, and my new uniform was set. My managers were not happy about my appearance, claiming I looked sloppy and unkempt. Even better, when the giant black dude, who hated his job, just slept in the back and talked on his cell phone all day, from the warehouse found out about this. He too had some old Circuit City t-shirts and joined in. Management hated us working together. I miss Circuit City. Story 19 I used to work at a lingerie store as an assistant manager, so I had to dress nice and look professional. All the other girls wore high heels and always ended up complaining about how sore their feet were at the end of their shift, and I always wore flats to avoid having sore feet. They were still nice, stylish shoes, but they didn't have towering heels on them. My manager always used to get mad at me for not wearing heels and tried to claim it was part of the dress code. I looked it up and showed her that it didn't say anywhere that I had to wear heels, just that I had to wear acceptable work attire or something like that, and she tried to tell me it was an out-of-date dress code or something, so I would tell her that she should get an updated one then. Eventually, she brought the head office into the argument, and the provincial manager was trying to tell me to wear heels to work. I told them they would have to pay me more than minimum wage to ruin my feet. I did not get a raise, and no one ever told me to wear heels to work again. Story 20 I was in the army for four years, as an intelligence analyst in an infantry division. I volunteered for a training exercise where I had to be a bad guy. Three months before the exercise, I was told a bit about the training and also given a form signed by the colonel, a big deal in an infantry unit, to stop shaving. It was pretty bad at having a no-shaving waiver and a three-month beard while still having to be in uniform and wear a beret every day. As a lower-ranked guy, E4, for the first week, Anyone who outranked me would either talk to me or just start to yell at me and demand push-ups, which made me quickly produce the colonel-signed waiver and shut them up. Never with a, my bad, usually just a mean look. After a week or two, they left me alone and just knew I was that guy with the beard. I think I smiled more while getting dirty looks in those 90 days than in any other 90-day stretch in the army. <laughs>